Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard, and you're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. My guest today is Dave Farrow. Marketing expert Dave Farrow is best known for his brain power. He is the two-time Guinness World Record holder for greatest memory. To earn this title, Farrow recalled the exact order of 59 car- decks of shuffled playing cards using the Farrow memory method. This method was originally invented to combat Farrow's dyslexia and ADHD, and it is now a unique memory system backed by a double-blind neuroscience study from McGill University. Today, Farrow uses his keen understanding of the brain in the public relations and media sector. He is the CEO of Farrow Communications, a full-service PR and marketing firm known for brain-based marketing and pneumatic messaging, representing a diverse range of clients across industry sectors and global markets. Feral Communications makes brands unforgettable. Welcome to the podcast, Dave. It's good to be here. Thanks. Yeah, so um, that's quite a history there and very impressive. (laughs) So why don't you (laughs) start by telling everybody a little bit about you, like how you started out, how you found out how how you learned this memory? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, as as it's in the bio, uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia, but I've got uh, I, I'm I'm a smart guy actually. I've I've been tested. I've got a high IQ. Um, depending on which test you look at, I've got a, a, a pretty high genius IQ. Um, but uh, like a lot of people, a lot of people watching this, they probably feel like. Uh, they're smarter than they're being tested for, you know, they're smarter than the job they're in, or maybe when they were in school, you know, they're smarter than the grades they got. Like a lot of people feel like they're not living up to their potential. And I definitely felt that way when I was a kid. Um, I was diagnosed with ADHD and dyslexia right around the time when I figured out I was a smart kid. I also realized I had these learning disabilities and um, much love to educators. M- my wife's a teacher for, you know, I, I love educators in every way. Uh, but I, I have to say that uh, the, the experience I had when I was a kid, where I really struggled because the, um, I don't know how best to say it, but it was more like because I had these learning disabilities, they, they wanted to put me into a box and I didn't quite fit into that box. And, you know, mind you, in those days, they didn't know uh, as much about ADHD that they do today, you know, so that's, that's part of the reason. And uh, I have great relationships even today with some of the teachers that, uh, you know, I, I felt made mistakes back then. But uh, long story short, I had to take control of my self-education. I went on a quest to learn about the brain. This was uh, before the internet. So I did it with books and science and uh, looking into the, you know, the early stages of neuroscience. And uh, that's when I developed my course. Uh, and over the years, over the, over the you know, the, the couple of decades, actually, I've been improving it and shaping it and changing it. Um, for a period of time, it was the best-selling uh, memory program of its kind. It was on Amazon's bestseller list for a year, uh, top of the bestseller list for, for that category. Uh, and I sold about 10 million bucks worth of the uh, courses. So I'm very proud of that. Um, and that's what led me to PR. That's what led me to my current vocation. Although I'm still the memory guy, I actually have a new online course coming out and uh, uh, a bunch of different stuff. I, I mean, I travel the world. I speak in places like Thailand and around the world. And I, you know, speak to college students. I do a lot of college gigs uh, about exam prep and orientation, things like that. Uh, obviously not during COVID, but during regular times, I, I, I do speak <laughs> at these places. Um, but uh, the... Uh, the, the interesting path that I had to take was really one of kind of necessity. I felt like unless I figure out how my brain works, I'm, I'm not, no one's going to figure it out for me. At least, you know, today you might have different standards, but at that time it was very clear that it was either, it was up to me or it wasn't going to happen. Um, and that's what really motivated me the whole time. Uh, how I got into PR later on is because I, you know, to, to sell the memory program, I, I, push myself in PR. Uh, to me, it was free advertising. I just had to be interesting. And I was pretty good at, at being interesting, I think. So I uh, got myself on over 2000 interviews. I think we're uh, well over 3000 now. It was just 2000 as of 2010 um, that we, we stopped counting, I guess. Um, but uh, led to the millions in sales, led to an infomercial. Um, but uh, I was on uh, you know great shows like Dr. Oz, Today Show, Science Channel, Discovery Channel, and a whole bunch of others. Um, and uh, 
because of all of that, I had authors and entrepreneurs coming up to me saying, hey, can you teach me how to do this PR thing? You seem to be really good at it. And that's when I started teaching people. I got frustrated by teaching and coaching because they weren't quite doing what I told them to do. So I just did some of the stuff for them. And then I hired staff and I developed uh, a company to do uh, PR and marketing. We mostly focus on uh, authors, uh, small businesses, uh, startups, things like that, really exciting stuff. Uh, but we have had some uh, you know, more traditional businesses that are launching something new. So we do focus on that as well. Um, I'd say our sweet spot is really the, uh, the expert, the thought leader, uh, who wants to get famous we can pretty much do that for you as long as you got the goods and you're you know you you're 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 really smart in what you do then uh then we can uh, get you the exposure get you on the shows get you in the media that uh, you know you deserve beautiful and you said well you know you just have to be interesting to get out there and i have been in the we can, audience we can help make you interesting though too we we do that yeah. a lot <laughs> but i mean i've been in the audience with you i think it might have been at secret knock i'm not sure um and you came out wearing your pharaoh hat <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. well i only did that like briefly because it's a mnemonic to, to let everybody know uh, my last name is is pharaoh it's spelled f-a-r-r-o-w right um and uh yeah I, I, I just started in the college market where i wanted people to remember my name so i put on a goofy like egyptian hat costume nowadays um you know costumes are not seen as politically correct and also it's not it's kind of cheesy from the corporate angle so we switched the logo up this is this is the current logo where it's an f with an arrow coming out of it mm -hmm. and that's like f with an arrow a uh, little mnemonic mm -hmm. um i knew that this logo stuck when my son started signing his name with that instead of writing out the whole pharaoh he was like f they put an arrow on it for his teachers mm -hmm. uh, and the teachers like send messages back like is this okay and i'm like yeah like that he's totally we're building a brand here and he's uh you know he's enforcing that <laughs> that's um, great but but yeah that's actually some of the basis of the memory techniques and and, and that's why i think it, it leads to pr so well and understanding of pr because um the human brain pays attention to some things and it ignores other things we know this you can't pay attention to everything you can't balance everything equally so how does you how do you make those decisions it actually boils down to neurology you, you oftentimes people don't really understand that uh, the stories you 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 select, the the information you consume, the the things you click on, a lot of that is based down on uh, psychology, your own personal preferences, as well as um, you know how the brain functions in general. So having a basis of understanding that, and and I understood how the brain works in order to help students make um, you know their studies more interesting, right? So that was a perfect lead in, along with you know the shows I did to help authors and experts make their topic more interesting and you know the creativity that came from teaching students blended perfectly well with the creativity to uh, to coach people in media so um, I never intended to be a, a PR guy I resisted that label for a long time um, but uh, turned out I was damn good at it and that's that's I think a, a good lesson of your show you know I think the thesis of your show is uh, all about kind of the meaning of life and your vocation and why do you choose to do what you do I, I believe that's correct right yeah and and in my case I, I think I'm, I'm very open and transparent that I didn't even intend to do this but it was a kind of a conglomeration of things that made me really damn good at it and I enjoy it so that's that's what I feel sometimes sometimes that's the meaning of life it's not what you sit down and go yes that's my goal sometimes it's Hey, what am I good at? What do people like? And what do I enjoy doing? What do I actually, I don't, I don't mind talking to people about media and media hooks and PR pitches. I, I kind of, I dig it. It's, it's fun, you know? And I'm like, yeah, I, I could actually do that all day, every day. If I, if I didn't have to do anything else, I'd love it, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and that's what kind of led to this. There was no voice from God that says you are destined for this uh, you know, to to be a hype man for this uh, small business. Like there's no, that doesn't exist. But it turns out, you know, I was good at something. I was doing it for my own business and translating those skills to someone else. And also, uh, I have to say, I have a team that makes me look really damn good. I got about 10 employees. I got some top people that uh, do a fantastic job. I'm hands off on a lot of the projects, but, uh, you know, they're handpicked and they've been with me for years now, I think like five, six years in, in many cases of my employees. So we've got a good family here going. Sounds like you do. So I know you help people remember names. So I think that my name is actually kind of hard to remember. It's Linert, L-I-N-E-R-T. So it looks like Lineert, but it's yeah. Linert. 
So how would you do something like that? Well, it actually it actually goes a lot to uh, to what people are into, you know. So, like I said, when I was in the college market, that Pharaoh hat, oh, that they loved that, you know. You go into a corporate boardroom, they're like, "Who is this clown wearing a costume hat?" Right. So sometimes it appeals to the audience. As the science guy in me, I I immediately think of of inert, like an inert gas, you know. That means you get along with everybody. You don't react to anything. You're kind of easy going, you know? Um, I can kind of visualize that, although it's hard to describe, because. but I'm really into the periodic table and science facts and stuff like that. Um, if you're not into that, I think the the linear line, line with a, with a uh, you, you could make a joke, something, you know, line with Qbert on the end or something like that, if you're into like video games. So sometimes that's what we try to do. I mean, a, a very old basic memory technique uh, for numbers, for example, is just to think of numbers in terms of, of coins. So if you see 25, you think of a quarter, you know, if you see like a dollar, you know, 175, it's a dollar 75. It makes it so much easier for us to think of um, just by providing that context. So, you know, that's very similar to, to coming up with a, with a play on someone's name. Uh, you can provide a little bit of, of, of context. Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I bet you there's some celebrities or, or you know, sports heroes that have uh, Leonard, you know, as, as the name. I, I, I have to look it up, but I bet you it's in there somewhere. So if somebody was into sports, that'd be a great one for them. Um, that, that is kind of the challenge of memory techniques is that it is very personal. When, when you teach somebody and somebody goes through my course, like my online course, for example, they become a master of being able to do it themselves. But there's not always, like my name I'm kind of lucky with because the, the, the Pharaoh thing and Egyptian thing, that's a pretty universal concept. But there's not always like one object that reminds everybody of it. It's like, Oh, if you're into superheroes, you, you know, Clark means Clark Kent. And if, you know, if you're, you're into, you know, candy, it's a Clark bar. And you know what I mean? It usually is a different thing to different people. Interesting. And then the part that I know I have trouble with, that's why I love Facebook. I can remember someone's, I can remember a name and I can remember the details about that name. Or sometimes I can remember the face, but I can't remember the name when I remember our conversation. But mm -hmm. putting the two together is a little difficult. Yeah, well, uh, I, I can give you a little memory technique right now if you're interested. Yes, yes. All right, so uh, there there are a number of, of steps uh, to master the art of names. You want to memorize, you know, hundreds of people's names. I do, you know, I remember I, when I do a, a, a talk to salespeople, for example, typically there'll be uh, at a sales conference, there'll be 200 salespeople. And at the end of the conference or at the end of my talk, I will uh, uh, remember everybody's name. And so it's a cool demonstration. But to get to that level, uh, you do have to practice the technique. And there's a number of steps the steps you can do them like in split seconds when you get good at them, but it does take practice. Um, but if I were to start with the basics, I would say that you, what you want to focus on is what I call the costume party technique. Um, so you want to take someone's name and turn it into a costume and just imagine them wearing the costume. It's the simplest thing in the world. Uh, so, uh, I mean, my last name kind of works well with the Pharaoh hat thing. Uh, the first name, Dave, uh, the first thing I would think of is like a wave. So you could imagine me dressed up like a surfer or something. And, you know, maybe maybe I look like a surfer. I don't know. So so if you imagine that, then that gives you that extra little little bit of effort to, uh, to remember it next time. Um, the other thing also is uh, quizzing yourself. Uh, before you hear the name. This is an interesting little tip because it actually improves memory for names about 25%. So one in four. So this is a big one. Um, it, it, we don't even know why it works, but we have some belief that it has to do with how the brain focuses on information and how it decides to focus on information. But basically, um, before I meet you, say we're at a party and I see like four, five, six, seven people, right? And I'm about to walk up to you. If I say in the back of my head, I wonder what her name is, before I hear your name, then my brain, the recall for that will go way up. So it's having that curiosity ahead of time that gives you an advantage. And uh, I believe that, uh, along with a few other researchers, believe that uh, people who have a naturally good ability for names, they naturally do this. When they're meeting somebody, they really are curious about the names. And as you know, most people don't think about that. They, uh, uh, it's kind of in one ear and out the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the 59 decks of shuffled cards. How did you even start with that? <laughs> well, but that that's kind of like, uh, I mean, that's kind of like, um, you know, you're just, you're just learning how to ride a bike and trying to describe how you win a motocross race, you know, like it, it takes years of practice and training. And I had to come up with a, a couple of 
you know, unique techniques that I haven't even shared, uh, you know, to handle all that. But uh, the long story short is that when you memorize information properly, that is, when you make associations instead of um, instead of just uh, uh, letting luck or repetition be your guide, when you actually make a, a connection on purpose, so you take control of your memory and make a connection, then uh, you'll with practice, you can you can know exactly how to trigger that in the brain. You can trigger uh, total recall whenever you like. And then when you when you know how to do this, when you do a proper connection, um, it doesn't fade like uh, it usually does with uh, with a short term memory. Um, so I mean, best example I could give would be um, if you see a movie and uh, you know you love this movie, uh, you go on throughout your day and you talk about it a few times and you, you know, in quotes, forget about it, right? But you don't really forget about it because you enjoyed it, it was visual, it had a lot of the different things that memory techniques give us uh, because they, they're interesting. Um, then, you know, three years later, somebody asks you about that, that, a scene from that movie and it immediately pops into your head. You don't have to think about it because that's how your brain is really wired. It's really good at remembering stories. Uh, for lack of a better word, you know, visual images that are kind of connected together. And that's a basis for how memory techniques work. Now, it would be absurd to think if I added another movie to my repertoire, if I watched a movie today, it would somehow knock out, you know, Casablanca that I watched a long time ago. You know what I mean? Like one, you know, adding one doesn't knock out the other. So our true memory, our regular memory that has to deal with stories, uh, episodic memory, doesn't have a limit. And it doesn't work the same way of, that our short-term memory does. So most people think our short-term memory is our memory, and that's really not the case. Our short-term memory is just something that you want to be able to hold in your head for long enough to say, you know, hold a phone number in your head long enough to type it into a phone, that sort of thing. Hold a password in your head long enough to type it into a, you know, a keypad or something like that. It's a short-term thing. It's like the desktop on your computer. It's not supposed to be on there all the time. Um, with long-term memory, there really is no limit. Even, even people who, uh, there's a lot of examples of people who, um, let's say, uh, you know, you, you grew up uh, um, in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, South America, uh, moved to America. There's a lot of examples of people who, uh, they speak English so much and they lose uh, their Spanish. I actually encountered a lot of this in, in my education. Um, and, or, or whatever country, you know, you're from and everything, it's actually, and, and it actually hurts the, like, these people are really upset because losing their language, they feel like they're losing their identity. But then, uh, you know, so we did a little memory techniques and some fun stuff, but at the end of the day, very, it takes very, very little practice and it all starts coming back. It all starts coming back. I mean, I, I learned uh, Cantonese and Mandarin when I lived in uh, Chinatown in Toronto. That's like 15 years ago now. Uh, but uh, I just, um, yeah, I did a trip to Thailand before COVID hit and uh, I was, you know, practicing some of that and, that, and there's a lot of Chinese uh, uh, people that are visiting there. So it all starts coming back when I just started practicing a little bit. So your long-term memory is very, very powerful. Even if you think you forgot something, it's likely you didn't, it's just faded and it can all come back very, very quickly. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the key is that your memory really responds to these vibrant things. That's why kids learn so well with games, uh, uh, vibrant things. I think we, we highly underestimate educational programming on TV and on YouTube and stuff. We, we think it's just a babysitter when uh, so much of the facts that kids get uh, comes from uh, making it fun. And, and I think also adults get that too. You know, if you see a movie that's you know, somewhat of a docudrama, you know, all of a sudden you remember all those facts far more than you remembered it when you, you know, were, were told it and studied in school. That's true. Yeah. As you're saying that, so I'm thinking of the, like the, I don't know what they're called, but like animal kingdom shows where you get to see the animals and they're talking yeah. about it. You remember, cause there's a picture that goes along with the words. Yeah, exactly. And, and the thing is that, um, th there's nothing wrong with your memory. There's nothing wrong with your brain. Uh, people think that there's something wrong with them because they don't remember the thing that they want to remember. But the fact is your brain is is operating exactly the way it's supposed to. Uh, it, it's just, it's kind of designed or, you know, it's, well, it's evolved, I should say, for uh, a specific set of circumstances. It's it's evolved to, like a, a very simple example that I teach in, in my class is the journey method. Um, we as human beings can travel a long distance, as long as we travel on foot, uh, we can usually find our way back. There's 
countless examples of people, you know, finding their way back after, you know, being, you know, kidnapped and walked a long way and, and, and then they escape and then they're able to find their about hundreds of miles in some cases. And it's because uh, our brains are really wired that way and they're very good at it because that is the primary task you want to have if you're a hunter gatherer, you know, way back in the day, uh, if we were easy, it was easy for us to get lost, we humans wouldn't have survived. So we have that ability. So what our brain does is it kind of takes snapshots, little milestones along the way. And then when you come back, it recalls it and connects those things together. That is natural. It's how your brain works. The reason you get lost while you're driving is because that's just a faster process. Your brain is really meant to do this while you're walking, a slower process. There's been tons of studies on this that have shown that time and time again. We have almost a genius level memory when it comes to that, but we don't have a genius level memory when it comes to memorizing math facts or, or um, you know, uh, uh, scientific definitions or, you know, computer terms or something, right? And that's because our brains spend so much time as hunter-gatherers. So we're really, really good at a few things. There's nothing wrong with your brain. You're just trying to make it do something different than what it's really good at. So in my course, what we do is we say, okay, you're really good at this, like making a journey. What if we made, um, you know, chemistry homework into a mental journey? And that way you can mentally find your way back and find your way to any answer right in the middle of a test, no matter how stressed out you are. And when people get it, oh my God, a light bulb goes off and they're like, wow, I've got, I've got my entire textbook in my head. And it's, it's easy. It's fun. And that's because, you know, you're, you're actually using your brain the way it's supposed to be used instead of uh, trying to force it into something it's not, you know, not good at. Exactly. So I'm thinking of people, I know there's a big fear as, you know, and I am getting older. <laughs> as we're getting older. You are not. Like losing our memories, you know, or we have family members who maybe have Alzheimer's and you were talking about, you know, we don't yeah. lose our long-term memory, but. I think those people start to lose their short-term memory. Can some of this help them so that well, they- Well, the number of things that go on with dementia, um, and it looks as though uh, Alzheimer's and dementia are either related or maybe the same thing, two sides of different point. There used to be several different um, you know, categorization. The more they studied it, they're like, well, maybe the same thing's going on here. Um, and it's, it's essentially damage to the brain. So uh, you want to put it in the category of kind of specialized, it's like, a, also in the same sort of category as like head injury, a stroke, things like that. And sometimes, uh, and, and I, there might be some people who are really, really into the trivia, and I know that's like an oversimplification, so I can, I can get more in detail later. But my point is that uh, if, if people want to know more of the science of it, the latest idea is that the beta amyloid uh, protein uh, that is meant to uh, that 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 builds up in high levels of the brain looks as though it's there to try to uh, clear out um, some some bad uh, some some bad bacteria and biome uh, in the brain, uh, and that's like kind of the latest theory. So the idea is that it's almost like an immunological reaction that causes damage in the brain, and then that damage causes the symptoms of Alzheimer's. So what we're talking about today, the 20, it's kind of the, in a group of 21st century diseases, Alzheimer's, diabetes, things like that, as it, it seems as though there's multiple causes and the symptoms are further down the road, where the, the uh, you know, 19th century diseases were like, you know, you have a virus, kill the virus, the disease goes away. This looks like it's multiple things that cascade. So just, I just wanted to add that in there because there's always trolls that pick apart every scientific thing. I know the science, just, just so you know. Um, but uh, the, the, what you can do about it though is really exciting though because there's a whole bunch of information on how powerful things like diet are, anti-inflammation is. Um, there's a whole bunch of information also on how important uh, brain training is. So a couple of simple concepts. Uh, we probably, a lot of us have heard of brain plasticity. Uh, that's where your brain changes itself. Now, the interesting thing is a lot of people think of brain plasticity as something you have to try really hard to accomplish. And the fact is we're doing it all the time. Every single thing that we do is leading to brain plasticity. Every single new thing, you know, when, when you're putting that mask on for COVID, for example, and I can't believe wearing masks are like a political statement. But anyways, you put that mask on, you start doing that day after day after day, it becomes like second nature and your body adjusts to it and your oxygen levels also adjust to it and everything. But with the first time you do it, it feels weird. And that's, that's basically brain plasticity. Your brain is getting used to a new thing and habits are formed and broken all the time. 
So the question is whether or not we're going to create good habits or not. It's not whether or not we're going to activate brain plasticity. It's what brain plasticity are we going to do? Are we going to reinforce bad habits or create good ones? And what we do know about the science is pretty clear that if you exercise on a regular basis, your, your risk for Alzheimer's, dementia, and a whole bunch of other problems like diabetes and everything else uh, goes down dramatically. Um, whether or not you're doing it for weight loss, like, you know, get rid of the scale, don't worry about it, but think about how long you're going to live and all the other benefits. There's a tremendous amount of benefits to just uh, moving on a regular basis every day, moving a lot. Uh, then, uh, you know, diet, getting something more anti-inflammatory. And what I mean by that is, is cutting out a lot of the inflammation uh, um, foods. Uh, and it's, it's pretty similar. And people talk about like nightshade vegetables and like, you know, tomatoes and, and mushrooms and, and green peppers, whether or not these, you know, in the actual studies, they're, 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 it's somewhat inconclusive, but if there is an effect, it's minor. But we do know, uh, you know, sugar uh, is a huge one. Uh, wheat products, you know, is a huge one. Um, um, any processed oils, things like uh, canola oil or vegetable oil, these these oils are created through a chemical process. Uh, they're not squeezed out of a out of something like uh, like olive oil, you know, uh, which is a, a direct derivative. So so the point is when yeah, hydro, hydro, hydrogenated vegetable oil as well, or or margarine as well is another great example. All these things, it's not that they're bad necessarily, it's that your body simply hasn't been experiencing them for very, very long. Um, it's one of the reasons why uh, people of Asian descent, for example, have a much higher incidence of, uh, of um, uh, lactose intolerance. It's because milk was not really used as a food stuff uh, in most of continental Asia for a long time. People of Holland descent, people who are descended from the Dutch, uh, they have the least amount of lactose intolerance because their lineage, they've just experienced milk a whole lot longer than everybody else. So their stomach created proteins and that's, that's, you know, that, that, that's evolution, that's biodiversity. So you take that same thinking, uh, canola oil, vegetable oil, refined sugars, refined flours, uh, they are very, very new things to our diet. If we keep eating them for uh, you know, 50,000 years or something, maybe our bodies will adapt and we won't have all these inflammatory uh, responses. But right now, as far as we know, eating um, as close as possible to the way uh, we had food available maybe 100,000 years ago is the ideal thing to do. And uh, there are a lot of challenges with that because most of the food available in the grocery store didn't exist 100,000 years ago. It's mostly uh, created, you know, like a banana did not look like the banana we see today, you know, um, uh, broccoli, uh, 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 broccoli, Brussels sprouts, kale, uh, cauliflower, and, um, and I think asparagus all came from the same vegetable that looks nothing like any of them. Uh, and it was just selective <laughs> bleeding and selective <laughs> Yeah, and also most of the vegetables we see actually came from a small two-mile wide area in Peru. Uh, tomatoes, not potatoes, but tomatoes and uh, green peppers and a bunch of other different things. And if you look at some of the original, like eggplant, the original eggplant still grows in, in India. It looks nothing like an eggplant. So fruits and vegetables have changed a lot, but at the end of the day, the big uh, shock to your body is refined sugar, refined flours, uh, they're like a hyper concentrated version of things uh, and uh, certain refined oils, um, bread products. And it's not like you can't eat any of these things, but just eat them mixed in with everything else. Don't go crazy on it. And uh, that's, that's a different philosophy, by the way. The anti-inflammatory idea is a different philosophy than just low carb. Um, the fact is, you know, potatoes don't seem to have the same effect on the body as uh, refined uh, flour does. Uh, your body, and and really what happens, this is a really interesting thing if you're interested. I could go on for hours, but uh, the one of the things that I found really interesting is that when you eat a lot of uh, refined sugars, and this is like, you know, normal diet, eating potato chips, drinking, you know, sugar soda, things like that. Uh, what it does is uh, the sugar provides a lot of food for bacteria. And we've heard of our gut biome and things like that. Well, um, there's a certain level of you know good bacteria and bad bacteria in there right well there's actually a biome in your brain there's a biome all throughout your body and it's um it's kind of like there's a there's a limit as to how much it can take before there's really negative effects so there's some people who can eat tons of sugar and the gut biome gets fed but maybe there's there's agents that counteract it we don't really know what's going on and they're fine but other people uh that though that bad bacteria just gets a lot of food and it just explodes and gets 
very, very numerous, and that's where you get gastrointestinal problems, dietary problems, constipation, diarrhea, all these different things. Well, that actually also affects the brain. It, it leads to everything from you know, memory loss, focus issues, hormonal interruptions, and it, we do believe that it is the, the source for, um, for Alzheimer's in that uh, your brain gets a lot of these these bacteria that have been fed very well by the sugars and the salts, like by the sugars and the and the and the, and the flours, and then uh, they run rampant. Your body tries to eliminate it with uh, the immune system, but it uh, fails. It doesn't uh, succeed, and that's when the beta amyloid protein, you know, the beta amyloid comes in, uh, trying to get rid of it, and in the process damages parts of the brain. Uh, but even with that, we do know that your brain can adapt around it. There is something called cognitive reserve, where if you train your brain mentally, if you do constantly new things like learning a new language and things like that and challenge yourself, then you build up a reserve. And even if you do get damage to the brain, uh, it's uh, minimal and uh, your brain can adapt around it. And it, it kind of, uh, it's kind of like the fountain of youth. The more you train, the, the longer you're going to be fit and healthy uh, and, and, and strong with your brain. Nice. And I've also heard a lot of talk around uh, like omega-3 fish oils or even avocados for brain health. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, well, your brain is made of fat. A lot of people who want to get rid of all the fat in their diet, they don't realize that, you know, fat is, surrounds all your nervous tissue, you know, your nerves, right? So the the low fat diet craze of the 80s was really a dumb idea. Uh, when you start taking fat out of your food, you shouldn't, fat, fat is not the enemy. Uh, sugar, I would say, if anything, is the enemy. Um, in small amounts, like fruits and vegetables and stuff, it's tasty. Uh, in too high amounts, your body actually adapts to it, and then the fruits and vegetables taste bitter, where if you didn't over indulge with by eating all the sweet stuff um for, uh, most vegetables actually taste mildly sweet but we've trained our palate to to such an extent like eating cake and everything that it tastes bitter by comparison then we have to add sugar or syrup or whatever to vegetables you know because we're not because we screwed up right um Anyways, going back to your to your to your fats, uh, yeah, um, avocado oil. Uh, I would also put like olive oil in there and everything. Those are really great for your body, and they're they're known to be very good for your brain. They provide the the nutrients, so it's not like a, a miracle cure. Uh, but if you, so it's more like if you don't have those things in your diet, if you don't have any sort of natural oils, you're going to suffer a lot. You're going you, you're you're really you're you're um you're nutrient deficient. And you won't necessarily see it right away like you would with a, a vitamin C deficiency where you get scurvy. Uh, but over the long term, you see it, you know, I mean, energy level, a whole bunch of other things. It affects your nervous system. And as your nervous system is just not running optimally, it will, um, you know, you'll feel it. You'll feel more tired than you have to. Uh, so, yeah, I, I eat avocados whenever I can. And I live in Canada. And if I can get avocados in Canada, then people over in California and all those sunny places, you guys have no excuses. Eat your avocados. <laughs> <laughs> I Hello. agree. I eat an avocado every day. Good, good. That's good for you. Yeah. And, and, it's, and it's interesting because people avoid avocados. They also avoid nuts because they're afraid of the high fat content. But uh, there's a lot of also other information that shows that um, like there's, there's, there's a lot of studies on diets. And I just, I'm, I'm voracious about this information. Uh, if you, if you eat, like let's say you say you snack on nuts instead of snacking on potato chips, you end up eating less nuts. So at the, at the end of the day, you're eating the same number of calories, but your body gets the nutrients it needs and you feel more energized and you don't feel as tired, which means you're moving around more, you're burning more calories. So it's, it's ultimately healthier for you to choose the natural thing, even if it seems like a concentrated high caloric thing, it's always more healthy than to choose kind of the manufactured thing that appears to be low calorie, you know? Yeah, that makes total sense because so for the last six months, I've been on the keto diet, but I think there's still too much dairy in that. So I'm working on how to... I, I would say, I'm not sure. I, I think the keto diet is a bit extreme sometimes as to how far people take it, but I think there's value in it, understanding ketones. Mm -hmm. um, I think that one of the best parts of the keto diet is a really normalized uh, fasting. Fasting is really good for your brain and really good for your body. Um, I do a fast every day if people are, are curious. Uh, it's like 18 hour fast. I stop at nine o'clock at night and usually about two o'clock by two o'clock in the afternoon is, is the first time I eat any real calories other than uh, coffee, which has no sugar in it. So 
Yeah, so like that's that's a that's a big thing. Uh, it seems like our brains and our bodies are uh, really good at uh, handling fast, and if we don't starve ourselves once in a while, we actually suffer quite a bit because our brains and our bodies use that starvation cycle as a natural cycle, like like the sleep cycle, um, to repair our cells. So the idea of starvation mode being a bad thing, that's kind of an 80s and 90s thing. And we know how, how bad the, the fads of the 80s and 90s really turned out for our health. <laughs> yes, yes, they do. <laughs> so um, let's go back to business for a minute. Absolutely. So um, when you're working with sales per people, when you're working with entrepreneurs and you're using this brain-based PR, how does that work? Yeah, well, I mean, ultimately, I see the the media the same way I see the human brain. You know, what is the me what is the media going to be interested in with your subject? So uh, the first thing people come up with is their sales pitches. You know, um, our you know my book outlines how they can manifest something or how they can overcome something or something like that. But the the, the way the brain-based view works is, is we have to see what the environment is. What are people talking about, you know? Uh, do, like we've recently during COVID, obviously we've tied things into health that we wouldn't normally tie into health. Uh, we've tied things into mental health. Um, we've tied things into race uh, quite a bit. We've had a, a bunch of, of great clients that they wanted to talk about you know, something else, but, you know, we sat down and said, listen, you're a person of color. This is a, a unique time in history. I think you have a great message that you can give um, and everybody's listening for a change. So let's do this. And, and our advice tends to be right. Uh, the, the media just picks up and we've had m multiple campaigns that just go crazy. And, and our, our clients that are completely unknown get in like Forbes and Inc and, and Business Insider and all that. So it's a matter of understanding that. And the other thing also is um, one of the main principles of uh, a brain-based approach is to look for uniqueness and uniqueness is constantly changing but it's what our brains pay attention to it's actually the reticular activating filter in the brain it's by the hippocampus it's kind of in the center if you can kind of think in the center area there um, it makes a decision as to what information it pays attention to and this works with memory as well as with with PR and marketing, uh, that decision is based on what it finds most interesting. So like I said, that hunter gatherer that went for a walk, well, if they see a tree and a rock, that's not really very interesting. So your brain forgets about it. But if you see a tiger, you're going to remember that like till your dying day. That's very, very interesting, right? And the reason our brains are set up that way is because if they weren't, we'd all be dead. So like, you know, we, we have this, this thing that, that, that looks for what stands out in the crowd. So the key is you want to stand out, but be what people are really, really fascinated with. And that, that's, that's kind of that sweet spot in PR. And we just, um, you know, just with this experience, we just, um, you know, I don't pay attention to the fads. I pay attention to the motivation behind the fads. And that's why we can usually kind of be ahead of the curve uh, and uh, make the pitches that, uh, that people really respond to, that the media really, really uh, loves. And then that also goes into sales and sales process. When we, you know, write copy for a website or we design an app or something like that, we, we look at uh, where are they going to look? What what is what is that eyeball interested in? What what is their motivation? That sort of thing, um, and that's the component that I think a lot of people don't think of uh, when it comes to sales. They're very they're very focused on themselves. How can I sell this? How can I do this? And they're talking to people who they think are just like them. But the fact is, there's lots of different types of people. They're all interested in different things, and the key is to make that sales pitch appeal to everybody. Right. So um, I'm thinking about the advice I've gotten that you want everything to be um, looking the same. So on all my social media, same, yep. you know, everything the same, but then, you know, I want to take advantage of the, what's happening now. So how do you right. have that um, solid base where people know who you are and what you stand for, and then use this other piece to actually go out and pull customers in well, well what you said though is two different things like making everything look the same is really important because that's like uh, that's like the mcdonald's idea you go to one mcdonald's you're pretty sure that that you know that that big mac is going to taste like a like the one in japan or wherever right so it's uniformity they can go to you and, and then they recognize you on other platforms uh that's good to build your base that's almost a mechanical uh, view. But the other thing that you said that I think is much more important is what do you stand for? What are you really offering? 
And that is the key. And uh, I would say, honestly, sometimes, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of doing a reboot of a lot of my memory programs and a few other things this year. Uh, but I mean, I've, I've been better at doing this for some of my clients than I have even for myself, but I'm getting my act together now uh, because I've just, in, I've just enjoyed so much doing the marketing thing for a number of years and doing so good. And we've been building this business. And obviously, I'm, I'm very successful, very grateful and everything. So, uh, but uh, now I'm even applying some of these things to looking at looking at myself. So even, you know, even the master can learn a few things is my point. Um, but uh, the, the key is, I think, is what are you giving? You know, so, so even that, you know, that Facebook post or that Twitter post or something is a transaction. Uh, and the person who is looking at it, think of them as a customer, they are giving you their time, which is a pretty valuable thing nowadays. They're like, should I read this whole freaking thing or should I scroll past it, right? So in every single case, what you're giving should be similar, should be the same, you know? Um, in my case, I, I'm, I'm giving insight, you know, something that they hadn't thought of, something. So I'm constantly thinking, okay, even in my posts, how can I make them think? How can I think of, hey, here's something else. Maybe, maybe this is something you want to think about, that sort of thing. That's, I think, what people come to me is, is what's around the corner? What have I not thought of? That's, that's what I'm giving, but that's, that's almost unspoken. It's not like it's a um, fair communications, giving you insight for to, you know, two decades or something. Like it's not, it's not like a tagline. It's like this is what people you know, understand they're going to you for. I think you're giving people really meaning. I think you should focus on that. And you're saying, uh, you know, so like your posts would really ask, like, you know, how do you find meaning? Uh, you know, I, I, you know, answer, answer me, you know, or, or you'd find, you know, you'd find individuals that just surprised you, you know, they're finding meaning in different ways. You could also do posts of the opposite of, of like, you know, these people are, are not finding meaning in their life. They're, they're wandering, they're, they're depressed. They're, you know, how can we help them? How can, you know, we understand them, that sort of thing. And how can you honestly find meaning in this existential nihilistic universe? You can get all, you know, uh, philosophical on it. Um, but that's what I think your brand is. And, and so the brand, you know, like the, the colors we use blue, blue shirt, blue, you know, blue logo, all that, you know, looking similar. That's good. Like even when I was on the Dr. Oz here, I'm wearing a blue shirt. Like, you know, I've got certain branding that's making everything look the same, but what you're giving to people is, is that service that you're giving them. Once you do that, you can do that across a broad spectrum. You know, uh, when the news turns to talking about race, that touches on the meaning of life, right? For me, uh, I talk about insight in the media, so I can, I can even as a, you know, like we talk about race, it's a hot button issue, but as a white person, I can talk, who's in the media, I can talk about how the media is reacting to these, these challenges and these concepts and what's going on, you know what I mean? Like, so you, you can, you know, you don't have to, uh, jump into every controversial thing, you can just, you can just stick to what you're really, really good at, but keep on giving people what they're looking for and they'll keep coming back again and again. Uh, I was very flattered that during COVID, I, I know of like, um, I won't say my name, but they're, they're, uh, we counted about four other, you know, PR and marketing firms that completely either shut down or paused all services uh, during it. And almost to the day of the lockdown, we had the phone ringing off the hook. People wanted to find out more. And it was because I'd been given all this advice in all my calls and, and, and posts and stuff. And I've been saying, hey, here's where I think things are going. And most of the time I was right. Not every time, but most of the time I was like, yeah, that's what's happening. That's where you're going. And so they were like, hey, how do I handle this situation? What do I do? And, and our, our sales actually went up because you know, I was still giving what people wanted. You know, we're, we're, we're um, charging people for PR services, but what they're buying is insight and direction for their business, you know, and then the services that go along with that. So being, being aware of what people are buying, I think is one of the biggest things. Uh, and you might not even know, uh, like, I don't mean you personally, but like the average business might not even realize why people like you, you know? There was a, there's a whole bunch of examples of this, of businesses that were selling one thing and it turns out people were buying something else, you know, uh, I, I, I get the name of it. There was a, there was a, a, a boot company that sold boots. They were, they were really, really beautiful boots made for like construction workers. And they became really, really popular in the hip hop community and sales just took off. They made millions. Right. Um, until the CEO said something stupid, something about, well, our, uh, we like that the hip hop people like our boots, but they're really built for, they're really made for hardworking people. And it's like, he didn't mean to be offensive. 
right? But the whole hip hop community is like, "What? We're not hard working. We're making all these songs and everything." And then it all it all imploded. But the point is, you know, you make a great product. You don't really know why people are buying it. So ask yourself that, and maybe you know, maybe reinvent yourself. You know, like uh, one one of my favorite stories is the story of American Express. They were uh, they were not a credit card company or even a credit company for most of their career. Uh, they were a courier service. Uh, they started off kind of like UPS. They were delivering things, but then they got into delivering uh, money, valuables, right? Then they got into, okay, you're, uh, then basically traveler's checks became the big thing. There was business travelers and you had to be able to pay things internationally. And oh my God, the banks made it so difficult. Regulations in different countries. So we had traveler's checks. These would be good anywhere around the world. American Express verifies they're good anywhere around the world. Then that essentially became credit because if you buy a check, but you haven't spent it yet, you basically have given the company money before you've spent it. So the, 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 something like most of their business model was the fact that they were, they were a bank. They were making so much money off of people buying them before they even sold them. And then that led to, uh, you know, traveler's checks became basically less, less useful. And then they switched to credit cards, but they didn't intend to be a bank. I didn't intend to be a PR company. It was, it was, let's follow what people are asking for, what people are demanding and let's kind of fulfill that. Follow the money and you'll be very happy in life. You know, you, and, and that also means you're following the service you're providing for people. Mm -hmm. Well, that you, help? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, you were right on when you said that, you know, my business is about meaning. Um, I'm an artist and yep. everything I paint has a meaning. Right. Everything, I paint these mandalas that are specifically for a person. I think about the person. I'm putting the energy of that person into the painting. Mm -hmm. Every and when people, when people want something like that, when they want maybe the, the perfect gift or something that is, that is, you know, energetically, you know, and people who, you know, believe in energy and, and, and feel it and everything as, as I do and you do, um, that is the perfect gift for them. So you're giving them that thing and, and once you give that gift away that that painting it, it's almost like you have to you have to let go of it being yours and it's theirs and that's that's a lot like what a business is you think it's yours but no it's it belongs to your customers you are facilitating that transaction and you should be honored and grateful to to be a part of that process but it's not it's it's not your ego it's not yours in right. my opinion. yeah and, and another thing that um, I always uh, work with people and say, okay, what's valuable to you? What are your val what's your value system? What's important? One of the most important things to me, not only is it things have meaning, but freedom is like number one at the top. So with all this going on right now, when I feel like freedom of speech going, yep. being <clears throat> asked, I just, oh, my heart just, you know, just yep. twists. You know, and I have to say something. I have to say something when, you know, someone is, uh, you know, the black race is, is killed or you just, you can't yeah. just sit there. I can't. When yeah, I, I, I really, I really respect that. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that there should be a place where everybody can say this. I, that's not actually one of the reasons why I got into this business is because I'm a big believer in freedom of speech. Uh, we founded this company on that. Um, and, and we take a little, you know, different, angle on it. Um, but uh, it, essentially, what I mean by that is, I am perfectly happy and, and enjoy tremendously representing people who I disagree with. Uh, we have a, a number, a broad spectrum along the political spectrum. We have all, you know, if you look at some of our past clients, all, uh, you know, backgrounds and everything um, are, are represented. And I don't agree with all of them. Uh, but uh, I, 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 I really love I love the idea of it's not up to me to decide who's right and wrong. Um, I believe anybody has the right to get the exposure that they deserve. If they if they have a strong opinion, if uh, we do, you know, we do make sure that everything that we send out and that we represent is based in in fact. So we do have references for everything. We kind of follow that sort of peer review idea that we have to reference something. We can't just can't claim this author is the best author, you know, in the world without you know there being some reference for that. So we make sure everything is factual. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we strongly fight for um, not our own agenda for for everybody's right to get their voice out. And I I, I keep on you know finding myself like politically 
politically, I'm, I, I, when it comes to America, I lean more libertarian, mainly because they're the only group in America that's anti-war. And I think uh, half of all tax dollars are spent on killing people and no one's talking about it. It's kind of a grotesque, horrible thing to me. Um, but I'm also Canadian. And in Canada, I don't really think the, the libertarian movement really is uh, mature or really where I would, where I would hang my hat. So it's like, uh, I'm a dual citizen. So it's like, I've got like two minds on the subject, but um, I would represent somebody with, uh, with all sorts of views all across the, all across the spectrum, if their message was something that was important to get out there. And I really firmly believe that society needs to have the, uh, the, the, the time square. Um, when we start to leave all of the discussions of how we should live our lives to just the experts, then we have essentially created a plutocracy where there's only a handful of people that get to decide what is right and wrong. And I've seen the scientific community long enough to know that the, the scientific community gets it wrong a lot uh, and, and then corrects itself. It's part of a process. And I do think that popular culture is a part of that process. It's not separate. Um, so yeah, I'm a big believer in what you're talking about. And, and, that, and that's also really important to handling crises. Um, I, I, I did an interview recently talking about a uh, crisis in a, in a company. And I said, well, if you set your values right in the first place, it's not a crisis. You know, if you look at like, um, I just give a, give a controversial example, like Chick-fil-A, uh, they did this thing about, I think they, they fought, uh, the, the bill. Yeah. They fought part of Obamacare. This is back in the day, but fought part of Obamacare about the mandated, uh, paying for birth control thing. They're based on Christian values. They thought this is not, this goes against our Christian values. They can pay for their own birth control, but this goes against our, our, our beliefs. And they got a lot of flack for it, but their whole premise was, this is our values from the beginning. Why are you surprised? This is, this is, this is not like, we're not being fake. We're being, we're being true to who we truly believe we are. And as a result, the, the Christian community and, and other right-wingers, you know, got, got in and, and supported them. And, and they had their sales were at an all-time high. So I think that it's, it's only a crisis when you're a hypocrite. You know, when you say you believe in one thing, but then you do something else. You know, that's the thing. Um, and that's really what I, I try to stand for. I, I, I say what I stand for and then I try to, to live that way. And I think that's all you can really do in society, you know? Exactly. Truth is critical, especially right now. Truth is so critical. Oh yeah. And actually one of your questions earlier, I wanted to say, um, you know, what's, what's the best way to live your life? And that actually, this kind of goes into it. My personal belief from, from when, like from way back, when people were trying to make me something that I wasn't, when they thought I was defective and trying to do this and do that, um, I truly believe that we should spend half of our lives figuring out who we are and the other half of our lives unapologetically being that. Oh. And the rest just don't waste any more time on anything else. Just uh, now be, be humble. You might not be who you think you are. You still, you know, you got to go through life and figure stuff out still, and we're always constantly learning. So spend half that time figuring out who you are and be really, really clear that you, you never really know uh, until the end and you're looking back. But at the same time, once you figured out who you are, be that without apology, uh, whatever you can be. And if it, if it differs from, from the norm, then, you know, you're meant to be within that discussion. I believe we, we have to have a large variety of people to try everything because we don't know what's really going to work. We need that biodiversity. I don't want to live in a world where everybody thinks the same, does the same, and is the same. I want to live in a world where everybody's different, and we disagree on things politely, and we come to some sort of understanding. And yeah, some people win, some people lose, but we have to have that disagreement because we won't grow otherwise. Yes, and I love that. I love appreciate, appreciating the differences and the uniqueness. I love that uniqueness part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think I, I know where you're headed, where you're talking about how, you know, there, there's some messages that you see that, that upset you. There's some things that upset you, you know, with your freedom wise. And I honestly, I don't know if you're right or wrong. Um, I, 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 I mean, in, in some cases, I would disagree with you on some of them and maybe agree with you on others. But at the end of the day, I think that voice is really important uh, to have out there because, you know, at the very least, it makes the counter voice um, to that. Uh, get their act together and get a really good argument to convince you. you know, if you're wrong, then, you know, if, I, if I'm wrong, explain it, you know, do a really good job explaining it. You know, it's like, uh, I mean, uh, just, just like the, the, the to take an extreme example, you know, the, the large, 
large number of like flat earthers on on YouTube, you know, and, and everything uh, shocked a lot of people who think that's just crazy, you know. Um, but I think it also got the scientific community uh, to get better at explaining science, you yeah. know, and we have, uh, you know, one of the biggest things I've always complained about science is that uh, we have large libraries of truth of, of stuff based on really good experiments that is not open to the general public. You can only go there if you're if you're part of that college or that university, you can only see behind the veil if you're a doctor, you know, you, there's, there's PubMed uh, if you have an account and then there's PubMed if you just do a, a regular search. So um, if, if smart ideas are going to be mainstream, then, then truth has to be mainstream too. If I, I, I would have to say like if common sense is going to be smart, then smart knowledge has to be common. And, and that, so I think some of these things, even as extreme and as crazy as they seem to a lot of people, they're breaking down the barrier of that ivory tower. And that ivory tower has to break down because they have to jump into the conversation. If you know everything, then come in and explain it. And if they're over there having their conversation, they can't really be surprised when a group over here comes to a completely different conclusion because all they have is the internet. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's beautiful times in that anybody can jump in and anybody yeah. can ask a question or challenge yeah. something. And that, and that really scares a lot of people who are credentialists because they feel like they earned their credentials. Everybody should just shut up and listen to them. But, uh, you know, having a credential, I'm the great example. Having a credential doesn't mean that everybody listens to me. You know, um, I have to earn it. I have to market. I have to get my voice out there. I have to get my arguments together in the right way. And when you do, you get you get rewarded. So uh, I think half the job is knowing the stuff. The other half the job is explaining it. And, you know, Einstein actually uh, uh, said this a lot. Uh, a lot of people deify him as a scientist, but he was really he understood humanities really well. Um, that uh, he, uh, you know, he basically said that um, the inability for an expert to explain a subject uh, to a novice shows a lack of understanding on the side of the expert, not a lack of, of, of intelligence on the novice side. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you can't explain this, at least the basics of something to any other human being, I don't think you know it that well, you know? And that, that's, that's a good way to kind of challenge it. <laughs> I agree. So, um... If people want to work with you, they want their PR done by an expert, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, sure. Um, well, uh, Fair Communications, faircommunications.com. That's the easiest one. I, I just leaned back. It wasn't even intentional. Um, faircommunications.com. On there, I have a link uh, right at the top right-hand side where you can book a free consultation. If you are a business owner or you're an author and, uh, or a speaker or something like that, you can book a consultation and, uh, and, uh, with me and we can talk. Uh, uh, about it. And I'll give a, a, about 20 minutes to half an hour. Sometimes I go longer, but I will give an honest, uh, an honest picture of what your chances are, uh, I believe, when it comes to getting PR or promoting your product or service. I think it'll make a big difference. All right. So before we end today, any last words of advice on living an incredible life? Well, I would say, um, kind of in keeping with what we've been talking about, I, I wouldn't get too obsessed about some of the little things. Um, I, you know, I'm a big believer in freedom, you know, just like you are. But at the same time, I think it's, it's almost pedantic to be obsessed about a mask when there's other things like farm subsidies and, you know, military spending that I would be more upset about. Um, I think that that's a good, that, and I'm not trying to challenge you here, but I, I, I think that's a really good way to see life is if we focus we can sometimes become so obsessed with one little thing is not right in our lives and it can crush us. And I've, I've been there. You, know, you can get very depressed because you don't get the numbers that you're looking for or the viewers or the hits or something. Um, but I think you have to focus on what is important to you and build on your strengths and compare your, your success only to yourself like last year can only compare yourself to your past self. And as long as you're getting better, as long as you're improving, then I've, I've got a lot of respect for you. Uh, as long as you're aiming up, you know, and, and trying to get more altitude, then I think that's an honorable life. Um, doesn't matter what the other planes in the sky are doing, they can go up and down, but just focus on yourself, focus on, on being a better person, whether it's morally, spiritually, ethically, or financially, or, you know, health and fitness. 
um, be better and aim to be better because I think that's what uh, that's where we find meaning is just in in the pursuit. You know, whether or not you achieve it every single time, don't worry about it. Just aim aim in the right direction, and uh, you got my respect. All right. Well, thank you so much. I've learned a lot just having this conversation. So thank you so much for being on today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. We'll talk to you again soon.